too much time because that's a big subject on its own. Then we'll talk about airway biodynamic before moving to general concept of management of adult laryngotracheal stenosis. And we'll go finally with, through some of the most common condition that we come across. So the airway is the passage where the air travels from the outside atmosphere into the lungs. It's a series of cavities that varies in complexity. For example, the nose and the larynx when they are more complex structure with mobile parts in the case of the larynx to more simpler structure with the trachea and the bronchi, which is more of a cylindrical shape conduit for the air to travel through. The larynx itself is the junction between the digestive tract and the respiratory tract. It sits in the anterior neck between C3 to C6 and open posteriorly on the hypopharynx. It extends from the tongue base to the trachea. Anteriorly to the larynx, there is the thyroid, which is, as you all know, has a very rich blood supply, and this becomes particularly relevant if you are considering an emergency airway, so you need to be aware of the thyroid, where would the thyroid isthmus sit, and is there a goiter, etc. So it's just something to keep in mind in that emergency in the middle of the night situation. Anatomical landmark. So again, it's very important that you are able to palpate an ache, especially in an emergency situation, and identify the landmark. So the landmark that you're going to see are going to be um, hyoid bone, thyroid membrane, thyroid notch, and one second, apologies. So I hope the pointer is working now. Okay, so you will have a hyoid bone, thyrohyoid membrane, thyroid notch, and thyroid laminae. You will have a cricothyroid membrane and the cricoid cartilage, which can be hidden behind the thyroid isthmus. It's often the thyroid isthmus below that. And this, you can see that um, laterally. And if you look on the neck, it varies a lot if you can palpate these structures. So it's a lot more a lot easier to palpate in a male thin neck when you have a prominent thyroid cartilage. However, in a female, in patients who, who are obese, have a um, large amount of fat in the neck, it becomes a lot more difficult to palpate. The area in a male, you can most often palpate the um, thyroid notch and take it from there. Um, however, if you can't find your thyroid notch, the area that you can always palpate and always feel is the hyoid. So you can start from the top. And this is, I'm sure all of you know about the difficult airway society management of airway emergencies. So you start with what they describe as a laryngeal handshake. So you put your hand around the neck and you palpate with your index and your thumb in this area. And you can always feel the hyoid bone. So you can wiggle it from side to side. And you can work your way down. In a female neck, usually often the most prominent part is the cricoid cartilage rather than the thyroid notch, and this is something you need to be aware of. And then you will have the trachea beyond that, which you can palpate if there is no goiter. Um, endoscopic gross anatomy of the larynx. So you, you start, if you're starting from the top, so you have the laryngeal inlet, which is epiglottis, are epiglottic folds, a retinoid and interarytenoid area. Beyond that, you will have the full score. You can see them on both sides and the laryngeal ventricle. And the area visible of the laryngeal ventricle is if you're looking from the top, you can see very little, but it could be quite deep. So if you are examining the larynx properly, especially if you're looking for cancers, etc., you either need an angled Hopkins rod to look through, or if you're looking into clinic, you can anesthetize the larynx, apply some local anesthetic, and then you can go with your video laryngoscope and go from the back and take a look and you can see, look into the laryngeal ventricles. Uh, beyond that, you will have the vocal cords, which we all know, and the subglottis, which the definition of the subglottis varies, but it's mostly based on head and neck cancer. So from, from free age, one centimeter below, and then you will have the trachea beyond that. Next, we're going to talk about laryngeal skeleton. So the larynx itself is formed of the hyoid bone, which is the only bone in the larynx, and it has lesser horn and greater horn. It's a floating bone. It's floating in the front of the neck, and it's not articulated with any other bone. 
but all of the muscles of the floor of mouth, the strap muscles, multiple membranes and ligaments all insert into it and suspend it in place. Cartilages of the larynx are the epiglottis, the thyroid cartilage, which has two laminates and superior horn and inferior horn. The inferior horn articulate with the cricoid through the um, cricothyroid uh, joint. And that's important because of with its relation to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. If you're looking retrograde, so you can identify the joint and go back. Uh, the cricoid itself is the only complete ring of cartilage in the airway. It has an anterior arch, which is quite thin, but posteriorly the plate of the cricoid is quite thick, so it could be like up to two centimeter in vertical height. And it has the articulation surface of the arytenoid cartilage on the top. And this joint, um, cricoarytenoid joints, have two movements. So you have the rotatory movement, which we all know about, that moves the vocal cord, so it rotates clockwise or contraclockwise, moving the um, vocal process inward or outward, opening and closing the glottis. But also there is anterior posterior movement. So that's a rocking movement. So the arytenoid you can, with the action of the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle, it can move it backwards so that increases the tension. So there is also um, tensor function to that muscle. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So next is laryngeal muscles. So they are two groups. So you will have the extrinsic laryngeal muscle and intrinsic. So the extrinsic ones are have one, uh, they have an origin outside the larynx and one insert on the larynx. And these are mostly the strap muscle. They move the larynx in bulk. So they play an important role with swallowing and also as an, they act as an accessory muscles um, in deep breathing on people in airway compromise. The intrinsic muscles of the larynx are muscles within the larynx. The origin and the insertion of these muscles are on the laryngeal cartilages, and they move these parts on each other. Um, naming system is very simple. It is between the two cartilages. So you will have thyroarytenoid muscle. The medial part will be the vocalis muscle. You will have the posterior cricoarytenoid and lateral cricoarytenoid, interarytenoid, etc. And that's a posterior view of your laryngeal muscle. So you can see this, these are the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle, interarytenoid, horizontal, and oblique. And you will have some muscle fibers running in the aryepiglottic fold. The muscles on the outside, we see laterally, it is the cricothyroid muscle. And this have a unique characteristic that it is the only muscle not supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So the actions, all the muscles generally are considered to be adductors of the glottis, although there is a bit more nuance to that. So the only muscle that opens the glottis is the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle. And this is arguably the most important muscle in the body. So this is A, part doesn't come down until C. So this is what open and allow us to breathe. So by its contraction, it rotates. So the insertion is on the um, muscular process of the arytenoid. When it contracts, the arytenoid rotates and the vo vocal process moves outward, opening the vocal cord. So you can see the movement in that direction. The opposite will be the lateral cricoarytenoid muscle, which move the joint the other way around and bring the vocal cords together. Interarytenoid approximate the vocal cord. The um, vocalis and the thyroarytenoid muscle reduces the tension in the vocal cord, so they can amend the pitch, but also they can they play a role in approximation, again, to fine tune the voice. Uh, the cricothyroid muscle action is to tilt the vocal cord, so it increases the tension and lead to higher pitch voice. So if you can see in the resting position, the vocal cords extend from uh, the vocal process to the anterior commission. While when it's tilted, this area is fixed, while the anterior commissure is moved forward, so the vocal cord is much longer, and that will lead to higher pitch voice. The nerves of the larynx, so you will have, the larynx is supplied by the branches of the vagus nerve, so you'll have a superior laryngeal nerve, which have a sensory internal branch, which supplies the glottis and supraglottis, and external branch, which supplies the cricothyroid muscle. The recurrent laryngeal nerve, also is a, a sensory and motor nerve, so it's a mixed nerve. 
the sensory fibers supply the subglottis, upper trachea, and esophagus, while the motor fibers supply all the other intrinsic muscle. There is also the anastomosis of Galen, which can be present in 80% of the population. And this is a diagram of the nerve. So this is the superior laryngeal nerve. You can see it branching. Um, and the internal branch pierces the thorough um, hyoid membrane and go into supply all the mucosal surfaces from glottis upward, while the external branch runs on the outside to supply uh, the craco thyroid muscle. Um, after reflexing in the chest, so the um, recurrent lar laryngeal branches out of the vagus in the neck, travels down into the chest, reflex upward on the right, as you know, around the subclavian, while on the left is around the aortic arc, and it runs upward in the um, uh, tracheoesophageal groove before entering the larynx and supplying all the muscles. And that you would see here is the anastomosis of Galen. So Galen is a Greek physician who described the vagus nerve. So he demonstrated that by cutting the vagus nerve on a live pig, the pig will stop squealing. And that was led to the discovery subsequently to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So there is a, a lot of variation in the anatomy of the Galen anastomosis. So it could be a single trunk, double trunk, or a plexus. And the role of it is not fully quantified. So some of it some people believe it explains why you maintain some innervation of the muscles after uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy. So some people you will see the muscle bulk is maintained and there is some synchinesis keeping, keeping the muscle there. While in other people, the muscle wastes very, very quickly and you have a thin boat vocal, um, uh, vocal cord when the muscle is atrophied. There is also some debate that if the nerve of Galen has a role to determine where is the final position of the vocal cord, why you see some people with paralyzed cord in the midline, while others will be in paramedian or lateral position. But all of that is subject to debate. Trachea is a lot simpler. So this is a cylindrical um, organ. It's not strictly a um, hose pipe, so it has anterior three-fifth is a cartilage ring, and posteriorly there is the tracheolus muscle and by its contraction, it changes the dimension of the trachea, leading to change to airflow. It has a close relation into the esophagus. So in a in situation of perk, um, tracheostomy, or emergency airway, you need to be careful with not damaging the posterior wall. Otherwise, you will end up with a fistula. So take a second before we move to uh, laryngeal function. So, developmentally, the larynx have three functions. So, the main function of the larynx is airway protection, then respiration, and in more advanced form of life, and humans in particular, it plays a major role in phonation. So, airway protection. When we, when we swallow, there are a few things, all kicks in very rapidly to protect the airway. So, the first that happened, there will be a cessation of respiration, on partial expiration. So as we're trying to exhale, that's where the breathing stop, and that will provide a constant subglottic air pressure that form part of the mechanism to prevent things being inhaled in as we swallow. The larynx get elevated and move superiorly and anteriorly, so it is in a way tucked under the tongue base. You will have a retroflexion of the epiglottis, the laryngeal inlet muscles will close that laryngeal inlet, so it narrows the inlet further and you will have glottic closure. A major mechanism of the airway protection is the laryngeal reflex, which is the arc of it is sensory fibers up through the superior laryngeal nerve, through brainstem, and back through the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And the area in the supraglottis and the laryngeal inlet have very dense sensory supply. So the tiniest amount of irritation will cause, as you all know, when you try and scope a patient, if you touch their epiglottis or their epiglottis full, patient gets into a coughing spasm immediately. Respiration. So if you look into this, if during phonation, the vocal cord will be adducted in touch and so they can vibrate against each other producing sound. 
if the patient is in quiet respiration, you will see the vocal cords are slightly lateralized and fixed. So we don't need to open and close the vocal cord. The space in between in a resting position will be sufficient for quiet respiration. So when you look, you will see them sitting in place when you're scoping a patient. In forced inspiration, if, either if you ask the patient to sniff or if there is an increased respiratory demand, then the retinoid will abduct opening space. And you can see a small movement in here, so a couple of millimeter of movement will lead to significant increase in the surface area, allowing the patient to take a lot more shift, a lot more air through their glottis. Um, I'm not gonna go much about phonation because that's an hour lecture by itself, but in general, there is a concept of mucosal wave. So for the very junior of you, there is misconception that it is the vibration of the muscles, the vocalis muscles that um, produces the sound, while it is actually the vibration of the mucosa. So the mucosa, when the glottic fully closed, so the mucosa will be in touch, and then as the pressure increased from the subglottis, they start opening from inferior to superior and from posterior to anterior in the glottis. And then once fully open, a puff of air goes and then it starts closing in the same direction. And that cycles happen again and again on, depending on the patient fundamental frequency. And they can modify that frequency by the actions of, of the laryngeal intrinsic muscle. The next four slides are a bit of for the physics geeks between you. So bear with me, I'll try to relate it to clinical scenarios and make that applicable to what you see on a day-to-day -day practice. So to go through some definition, so the airflow happens when there is a pressure differential between two points. So that's how wind work and that's how our breathing works. So when we inhale, the pressure drops, the intrathoracic pressure becomes negative and below the outside atmospheric pressure, so air travels in and vice versa as we exhale. And we call that the driving pressure. The flow rate is the amount of air that we remove on one second. And that's different from flow velocity. So the flow velocity is the distance the air travel, is how quickly the air travel in one second. And the two are related. So the flow velocity is the flow rate divided by the cross-sectional area of the tube or in the trachea. So most of that, imagine it applies to the trachea. It got a lot more complex in the larynx and in the nose. But in a cylindrical tube like the trachea, that's the relation more or less. So if the surface area goes down and the rate is stable, then the velocity goes up and vice versa. The second concept is the flow pattern. So there is, in general, there are two ways of flow. So the first one is the laminar flow. And that's where the airflow in layer within a tube. So that applies to air, that applies to liquid running inside um, pipes. So the central layer is normally runs faster than the peripheral layer. So it is the, the fastest flow will be in the center and it goes down gradually towards the outside. And the flow rate in this in this pattern is related to the driving pressure. So you exhale deeper, then you shift more air in, etc. The second uh, pattern is a turbulent flow where the air runs in a random direction. So in addition to the axial flow, there is a constant radial flow. So there is air is moving against the wall, causing a persistent wall on the persistent pressure on the airway wall and some of the air is traveling along, in the, along the tube down into the lung. And that consumes energy. So there is a lot of lost energy with the pressure that exerted against the tracheal wall, which means that it requires higher driving pressure. So the patient in, with airway stenosis or airway compromised will need to inhale deeper. So they need to increase the negative pressure in the intrathoracic pressure so they can shift some air through that segment. There are a variety of equations that get mentioned and I'm just gonna talk about two that are the key principles of how air moves from one point to the, to the other. So the first one is the Venturi equation, which says that if the flow rate is constant, the flow velocity is inversely related to the surface area. So if the patient needs to shift the same amount of air, so the same volume of air need to be shifted in the 
in one second, if you increase the surface area, you drop the velocity and vice versa. And in a stenosed airway, when the patient respiratory requirement say is the same, so they need to shift the same amount of air between their normal diameter and the stenosed airway, they need to breathe a lot faster so they can get the air to, to go through quicker so they shift the same amount of air. So that's why the patient become dyspneic because they had to breathe a lot faster so the air can travel in, in the same volume. The second principle is Poise equation, which say that the airway resistance is inversely related to the radius of the tube to the fourth power. So it magnifies significantly. So R is the resistance, eight is a constant, Link, L is the length of the tube or the length of the stenosis segment. And N is um, the density of the air. So that's where heliox come. So why heliox work? Because it drops uh, the density of the air. So you can reduce the R number. And that's related to the fourth power. So if you have a slight change into the airway diameter, lead to significant increase in resistance. So the patient need to inhale deeper. So they need much higher driving pressure to move air from one point to the other. And finally, some computer generated um, reconstruction of how air runs, and this is courtesy of our aeronautical department here in Imperial College. So you can see the maximum airflow will happen in the posterior glottis, and I will take you through that later on. But you can see in the trachea, that's laminar flow. So all the air runs in the same direction. You have a small stenosis and then you start getting some turbulent. Severe stenosis, you will get significant turbulence and you can see the air is traveling in all directions. So some of the air is going down, but a lot of the air will be putting pressure and there is a lot of wasted energy. So that concludes our first part, which is anatomy and physiology. So before moving to adult airway stenosis, I'm sure many of you have worked through pediatric units and this and the pediatric is a, almost a different disease to adults, so it's a very homogeneous. So I don't want to sound patronizing to the pediatric airway, but it is the vast majority is post PICU or post NICU stenosis that get classified. There is standardized way of treatment, and by virtue of physiology of pediatric, they usually respond a lot better. While an adult is a lot more complex. So if you have a lot more variety of diseases, variety of presentation, variety of treatment that get involved that you need to apply. And whatever you do, unfortunately, does not work very well. So it's you fighting again the patient physiology. You fix something and then it recurs. So there is a very high risk of re stenosis after all our intervention. So when we have a patient, we have them for life, more or less. So we can never pretty much we can never discharge any patient that gets referred to our unit. So the general principle, there are two ways to manage airway stenosis. So endoscopic, which is the vast majority of our patient, is we maintain their airway with endoscopic procedures. Sometimes it can be something that you need to do frequently. So you might need to do annual um, dilation, patient come in, get dilated, discharge, call us in a year time saying, I'm getting tight again, we get them on and so on. Some people you can do something more definitive and that will depend on the, what's the underlying pathology. So sometimes all you need is endoscopic approach and that can be curative. You need to keep an eye. And if they're gonna recur, they usually recur within the first two years. If you get them beyond two years, there is a good chance that they're gonna remain open for good. Um, so that's a microlaryngoscopy, laser and balloon dilation and all its other modification, including laser arteriodectomies, et cetera, et cetera. We also do endoscopic laryngotracheal reconstruction, and I will talk about that procedure in a minute. So that's the vast majority. This is our bread and butter. Then we'll have the open procedure, and these fairly follow the same line as pediatric surgery. It just, you need to take into account the patient own physiology, and you put a graph and it doesn't survive, et cetera. So there is a bit more that you need to do to adapt to the adult physiology compared to Charles. So we'll have laryngotracheal reconstruction, cricotracheal reconstruction, resection, and trachea resection, and we'll go through these treatments. 
So endoscopic dilation. So I'm going to spend a minute on this because this is very important. A lot of people get confused about which way to put your scope, how to position the patient head. So remember, it is sniffing the morning air. If you put your scope and you don't get a view, you raise the head, you don't drop the head. Patient, you know, like when I, when I see new registrar, people working in other units or even working with other bosses when I was a registrar, you can't get a view, then you, they will tell you to extend the neck. And that's not what you need to do. What you need is the Atlanto, um occipital joint need to be extended while the cervical thoracic need to be flexed. And if you take a look and you can't get a view, you raise the head. And if you don't get a view, you raise the head. And you keep raising the head till you can't raise the head. Then you start cranking your suspension. Then you put pressure from the outside, etc. We use two scopes and two scopes only. So we use DDoScope, which you can see here, which is a glottic scope that sits just above the vocal cord. And we use a lint hole. And you don't need anything else. Th those two scopes will get you view in 99% of cases. I don't, I've never seen anterior commissure scope in our unit being open or used ever. So DDO scope is fantastic. It's just the dimension are perfect. And this is our setup. So you will see this is in suspension. That's the DDO scope suspended on a table. We do supraglottic jet. So we use that for the vast majority. So you will have a jet ventilation, automated jet ventilation and a light source coming from here. And then through the scope, you do your steroid, you do your laser, you do your balloon dilation. So this is the standard. So this is my bread and butter operation. This is a lady with idiopathic subglottic stenosis. You can see this is where the diameter of her airway, and that's what she comes with. So she have like a four by five millimeter airway. And the first thing we do is we inject steroids. So you need to put, to put either uh, methylprednisolone or tramcinolone. We use methylprednisolone as the particles are smaller, so it doesn't obstruct your view. Well, if you put kenalog and it gets leaks out, then it's all over the place and make your operation more difficult. Um, then we make laser cuts. Apologies for that. This is an old slide. And because of the restriction, I couldn't get the new pictures of good Slide. So this is with our old laser machine, and you can see there is a lot of scarring. So now with the modern lasers with ultra pulse, you can get a much cleaner cut. So you do your crochet in, uh, incision, you put your balloon, you dilate, you're going to need between 60 to 90 minutes dilation. And that's what it looks like. It looks like a dog's dinner when you look at it, but it heals all right. And then most importantly, that you leave these bridges of normal mucosa in between your cuts. So the main principle in airway surgery, you should never cause a circumferential injury because that by nature will stenose back. The way the body heal will always close. If you have a circumferential injury, it will always close. As I say, nowadays we get it a lot neater than that with our modern um, lasers. And that, that's done. And then we do that, we repeat that as and when patients require, and we keep the patient maintained this way. Next procedure is endoscopic laryngotracheal reconstruction, or this is uh, being described by my colleague, Mr. Gori Sandu. He called it the Madam procedure after the first patient he ever performed this procedure on. It's almost exclusively for idiopathic subglottic stenosis. This is, you will see the stenosis, you make your laser cut just to identify your depth. Then you take your micro debrider and you need to debride the anterior two thirds. And you need to go all the way down almost to the perichondrium because the disease in this condition is in the sub epithelial layer. So the general, the standard approach is to do cricotracheal resection where you resect this area, but the cartilage is absolutely fine. So we do resect the disease area, but we do it internally without resecting the cartilage. Then we take a skin graft, we put it inside out. So the epidermis side is pointing towards the lumen and this is the dermis side. And we put that in situ and we stitch it in place into the airway. We leave it for a couple of weeks. You come after a couple of weeks. That's what it looks like. You take it out and that's what it looks like. So you see that's your trachea and you have all of these area, keratinized area where the skin has taken. 
and it's not you don't want skin to take what you want is you need to see some keratinocyte and you depending on the um, presumed suppression of the fibroblast proliferation so there is an interaction between keratinocyte and fibroblast and there is some good research in skin so dopitran contracture if you if you just divide it it recur if you put skin graft on top of it it's a better chance of healing and that's on the same principle and when you go back you go six to eight weeks back and you can see all of that keratin you ideally you wouldn't like to see any of that but most of the time you will see so you will you will laser will do re laser resurfacing and we do that in quadrant so if it is if it's circumferential you do front and back on one go then the two side on six to eight weeks later and you will hope that will settle and we get epithelialized with respiratory mucosa it's never perfect because a lot of the people will continue to have squamous epithelium which means you lose your ciliary uh, clearance and people will complain about mucus getting stuck but this is unfortunately you need to weigh and balance and put these options to the patient so they know what they're signing up to laryngotracheal reconstruction so this is open surgery you do it by doing a laryngo fissure so you open the larynx anteriorly and then you divide the cricoid ring so you split the larynx in half so you take a rib cartilage you form it into a t shape and you insert it at the back Again, because of what I mentioned, in adults, that cartilage mostly dies, so it doesn't take, unlike in kids, to protect that area. So we use it just a spacer for while it's healing around the stent, and we put a skin graft, and you, you can see this is patient on stent removal, and you can see some of the skin graft has taken in the back. Cricotracheal resection, this is operation for severe stenosis at the level of the cricoid and upper trachea. So you need to resect anterior third to anterior half of the cricoid. You resect some of the larynx, but you keep posterior tracheales and you plug that in. So effectively, you put the trachea inside the cricoid ring and you stitch around so you have a complete mucosal coverage. Um, ideally, you should do that without a tracheostomy and without a stent, but sometimes you don't have an option, but you need to put that. Trachea resection is a lot simpler, so you just if you have a stenosis segment, you can resect up to four centimeter. And with some modification, if you do um, lingual ligament release, and if you do suprahyoid release, you can resect up to six centimeter and you can do end-to-end -end anastomosis. We do that almost always without a tracheostomy and without a stent. So we just wake the patient up, keep them in for a few days, take the drain out and get them home. So moving on, the last part of uh, the talk today is on our uh, condition. So this is our first 700. We had good 250 cents, but we haven't audited our results. So we're waiting to get to 1,000. If you can see, almost 50 are acquired laryngotracheal stenosis. And some of that is subglottic and some is tracheal. So that intubation or tracheostomy related. And it's almost half and half. So Half of the patient will have post-intubation, half will have post-tracheostomy. There is also the bilateral vocal cord mobility. So some of these will be caused by prolonged intubation. So it's mostly post-ITU is the majority of our patients. Then you will have GPA is around 10% and idiopathic subglottic stenosis is around 10% and then more, more rarer conditions. So we'll talk about the top four before we finish. Um, first is post-ICU airway stenosis. So if you look into post-intubation, almost 50% of the patient will have immediate injury to the mucosa. So there will be inflammation you can see in almost half of the patient, but only 5% will go on to form a stenosis. And that's possibly related to the patient's own physiology, the way we heal, how aggressive their healing process, do they form similar to the way with what kind of fibroblast gets recruited, how people who form you know, hypertrophic scars or keloid scars, although not necessarily related, but in the same mechanisms. And in our experience, early intervention improves outcomes. So if you go in while it's all inflamed and granulation tissue, you inject some zero, you do gentle balloon, and you have a good chance of stabilizing that airway. Once you leave it to become fixed scar tissue, then it becomes a lot more difficult to deal with. 
there are various risk factors for this. So the size of the tube, using the tube too big, is a major risk factor. What people fail to appreciate that the size of the trachea is proportion is related to the height of the patient and independent of gender. So the shorter the person, the correlation is very tight. The, the taller the person, it gets wider, so the spread gets wider. So there will be more variation in the size in a taller person. So you need to keep that in mind. So if you have a gentleman who is like really small, don't go and put a size eight or eight and a half tube in, then they will need a small tube. And the same for a very short lady. So you almost need a pediatric sizes. Cuff pressure, we all know about, so you need to monitor these. Patient agitation, so the shear forces of the tube pulling and the cuff, the shear forces on the mucosa makes a huge difference. So a patient, agitated patient, under sedated, thrashing around will damage the mucosa. The role of free flux is questionable. Um, patient infections and comorbidities, so you will get a lot of infection in this area, you will get reflux, you will get saliva sitting and pooling on top of the cuff. So that's why you need, by the, every new tracheostomy patient, you need to put a subglottic um, suction aid so you can always suction. The same with any ITU tubes, all of them come now with a suction port and you need, they need to be used. Um, and finally is the patient immunology and their healing um, and their foreign body response play a major factor. And it goes from mucosal injury, perichondritis, granulation tissue, cartilage necrosis, and stenosis. And you ideally you want to treat it here, not there. Post-tracheostomy. So post-tracheostomy, you will have what we call in our unit lomboid, although nowadays it goes by the American A-frame deformity. So it's mostly related to over resection of the cricoid cartilage when doing a tracheostomy. So when you're doing a window, you need to do the smallest window you can and maybe do the releasing cut. So what I do, I do small window and cut like four crochet cuts just to release it and allow the tube without losing much integrity. And I try to make a single um, cricoid, a single trachea ring. I don't cut window through rings as, as much as I can avoid. Because when you end up with a scar tissue, the walls get pulled in and you end up with this A-frame deformity and that's what it looks like. And endoscopic approach is really doesn't work. So you can take it, you know, a crescent of, of a, you get down to cartilage, but true treatment to that is trachea resection. Bilateral vocal cord immobility. So this could be neurogenic as bilateral vocal cord paralysis or cord fixation. It's not always easy to distinguish. So is it a true unilateral vocal cord paralysis or is it intubation related? So there are various ways to classify that. And this is what we use. So we have the grade one when the joints are mobile and there is no scar. And that's possibly, and that's neurogenic. So this is vocal cord paralysis. Grade two, when you have the joints are fixed, but there is no interarytenoid scar. And that could be joint subluxation, intubation injury. It's very difficult to, to injure both sides. You need to be really going for it to, to damage both sides. And it is, anyway, what people talk a lot about, oh, we, we didn't do it, especially cardiothoracic, or they'll tell you, oh, we, the nerve is definitely intact, that's intubation. It's really, you need a lot of force to dislocate that joint. Rheumatoid arthritis can fix the joint, so keep that in mind. So if you have somebody and you can't explain, make sure that you do, you do immunology screen. Grade three, they will have inflammatory response. So you will see if you see someone post prolonged intubation, they will have a lot of granulation tissue, granulomas, intubation granulomas. And that's when you need to treat it. You need to inject, you need to repeat steroid injection, make sure that all comes. Once it becomes a thick, mature scar, it becomes a lifelong disability that will require lifelong treatment. This is the most difficult part to fix in all of our cases. And we do this, we treat it either endoscopically. So this is again, um, aer um, flow dynamic. Um, you can see, so this is the glottis, that's the anterior glottis. This is the vibrating segment. This is the vocal process. And you can see the vast majority of airflow 
happen at the back. So a millimeter gain in here is much better than taking all of your vocal cords. So people who say, do cordotomy, cut part of that. You give the patient really, really poor quality bones for a minimal gain. So that's what we do in our unit. So we do laser arachnoidectomy rather than cordotomy. So that's the uh, vocal process. We go from the end of the vocal process and we cut with the laser expanding within the body of the arachnoid. And you need to keep going till you have same plane as the subglottis so you can't get that laminar airflow I mentioned previously. And that's what it looks when it's healed. So it, it does affect the voice. You get a breathy voice, but the impact are much better than doing a chordotomy while taking part of the vocal cord and the vocal process. One from last, so this is GPA, um, which used to be called Bigner's granulomatosis. So now we refer to it as GPA. It's immune mediated small and medium vessel vasculitis. It affects one quarter of the cases, affects the airway. Sometimes it can be confined to the airway. So some people will have localized subglottic upper tracheal vasculitis and nowhere else in their body. They respond differently to uh, systemic treatment. So some of them are maintained on a very small dose of prednisolone. Some will require all the way up to. Um, monoclonal antibody treatment, etc. You should try, while the disease is active, you need to try to avoid um, instrumenting the airway as much as you can. You need to be really gentle, put steroid, gentle balloon, and keep that till your medical colleagues get the disease under control. Because that's what treats the patient, not our treatment. Um, Mostly, we treat these patients with endoscopic steroid injection, laser and dilation. Once they have burnt out disease or well-controlled disease, sometimes they end up with a circumferential scar, so you treat them as I mentioned previously. We do open surgery sometimes, mostly on the ones that involve the glottis. So if they have a fixed glottis, then they will need an LCR, but you need to make sure that their disease is completely stable. They've been stable for a couple of years on the stable medication, or they have like a burnt out disease, so they have been medication all stopped and they have no sign of disease activity. Otherwise, you're doomed to fail. And finally, idiopathic subglottic stenosis. So this is possibly 10 to 15% of our workload. This is a peculiar condition. It affects females only and 95% Caucasian. So we very, very rarely see people from other ethnicity. I think I can think of only one patient and we keep sending to the rheumatology trying to find if she have any vasculitis. The mechanism of idiopathic subglottic stenosis is variable and I will talk at this in the next slide. Um, usually there is a stenosis at the lower border of the cricoid and upper part of the trachea. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. So you, you biopsy them, they come back as chronic or acute on chronic inflammation. There will be no evidence of vasculitis on biopsy. You send all the blood and you need to send the blood regularly. So you need to send ANCA at least once a year because some of them will go through seroconversion and what you've been treating as idiopathic subglottic stenosis, it turn out to be vasculitis after many years sometimes. And to diagnose them as idiopathic, they should have no intubation for the last two years. If they have intubation, you need to assume that post-intubation rather than idiopathic. And as I said, the histology is normally very bland, so you'll get a fibrosis and inflammation, and you don't see any cartilage involvement, so it's just intraluminal disease. The pathophysiology is subject to various studies, so there is an international ISGS 1000 study, so managed to recruit 1000 patients, and they're looking into various aspects. So there is some people looking at the role of hormonal receptor, which makes sense because it only affects female. Some people are looking at fibroblasts, including our groups here at Imperial. Um, genetics possibly plays part of it. And there is theories that it is possibly there is a role of mycobacteria and host pathogen interaction. It's all work in progress at the minute. General management is the majority. We maintain them with regular endoscopic dilation. So they come every 12 to 18 months or steroid injection, laser and dilation. 
in office steroid injection, this is really in vogue at the minute, especially in the States. So you bring the patient every four to six weeks to do injection awake in clinic. I do this. And in my mind, I'm still not sure about the role or how useful it is. It just, it, it seems to, I use it too for the patient who recurring quickly. It just tries to increase the interval between dilation. The more I do it, the more, I'm, the more skeptical I've, I've come about this treatment. But keep going. I'm keeping a record of my um, work, so keeping an open mind. Madden procedure is what we mostly do here in our uh, center and cricotrachea resection is the standard, well, gold standard treatment, and that will give you the best chance, but it's an operation with quite a, a lot of comorbidities you need to take into account before going ahead. And I will finish on that, and happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Chad. That was a really great talk. Um, we do have a few questions that have just come through. A couple of them, I'll just go from the first uh, one that came through. This is from one of our um, junior colleagues and they're asking about um, when you were talking about the airway uh, dynamics earlier. You mentioned dyspnea in the patient with airway stenosis and they wanted to know if the patient um, with a sort of chronic picture would present more with a, a deteriorating dyspnea before they progress to stridor or would they come in straight away with a, a noisy stridor, stridor type airway? They, they don't normally have dyspnea. Dyspnea is mostly for the acute. So they can have a cro acute on chronic. They suddenly go over the edge. So these patients, because the gradual, the stenosis happens over a 12 month period. So it is very gradual and their physiology adapts. So you'll, they will see them functioning really well until their airway goes down to four or five millimeter. And then at that critical point, a small mucus plug or a small, any swelling on the airway, drop them over the edge. So they normally, they come to our clinic with what we call noisy breathing. So this is half of patients in our clinic, you will come and they will have what you would call a significant stridor, will be panic mode if you see them in any. In our clinic, this is standard, all of our patients, they're like, <laughs> I, feel, I feel fine doctor, and they're like, <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's relative really. Great, thank you for clearing that one up. Um, we had a question about the CAJ fixation post-trauma. Um, obviously, there's the traumatic effect of it, but there's a question, is there anything that should be done to reduce or reverse the fixation that's happening? If you catch it immediately, you can click it into place, and there will be some hematoma, and they might, you might end up still with a fixation. One, it is one it's gone, it's gone. So one it is it's been dislocated, there will be there will be bleeding inside the joint and then it will all scar and then you can never get it to move back again. People describe various remobilization procedures. So you divide the um, so you divide the capsule, so you release all of the scar tissue and you put mucosal flaps. I think the jury is out on these ones really. But in theory you can remobilize them. However, success rate it works in a few people in their own hands, but not general. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a question here from Ben Miller, which is, would you recommend lateralization suture as an adjunct to arotenoidectomy? No, the answer is, it's a rubbish <laughs> operation. I've, I've written it sometime, but it is, anyway, it's temporizing measure. It's, you will have it's what, what I was talking about is where is the maximum airflow is in the posterior glottis. And if you put a suture, more or less, it will sit at the tip of the vocal process and it will lateralize the middle of the vocal cord. So you, the voice will be terrible and the airway, the gain is really minimal. So the only role I see to it is a temporary measure, hoping that you're going to get some function back mm -hmm. before doing something permanent. Once you do laser arachnoidectomy, that joint is fixed and that is not going to move. So even if there is gain function, that joint is not going to move. So if you are absolutely certain that you left the nerves intact and you are working and you want to try something that is reversible, yes, do suture lateralization, but don't do it as a permanent solution. It's a really terrible operation. And it cuts cheese bars through and it doesn't work. So don't do it. Thanks, that's a very comprehensive answer. And um, we have, have a question from Richard Stephen, which is, what do you do for your preoperative workup? I presume this is in terms of assessing 
a patient with a suspected stenosis and your workup prior to doing any surgical intervention, what would you do? So when we see them in clinic, you start as normal, you take history, you take, you pay attention to their background, systemic diseases, other factors. People often come and they describe we've been asthmatic all our life while they, what they actually have is idiopathic subglottic stenosis. Um, you need, and then you need to scope them. They need a swallowing workup. So pretty much every new patient of us will have a comprehensive swallowing workup with our speech and language therapy. You need two points you need to pay attention to, the movement of the vocal cord, because that will decide what you can or cannot do and how they're gonna respond. So you need to document that every single patient and you need to document the state of your swallowing because that again will dictate what you can or cannot do. You will send the patient for um, blood, including um, full immunoscreen, ANCA, ANA, et cetera, ACE, and that's about it really. CT scan have a role. It's mostly useful with extrinsic compression, but the actual diagnostic test that most sensitive in, in our view is examination under general anesthetic. So the first, every patient comes our way, will have an ML minus plus dilation as a staging procedure to see how bad is their stenosis, what's the length of the segment, we palpate the arytenoid, see if their mobility. So that's possibly more sensitive. Doing a CT scan can help, but they can often either overestimate or underestimate the stenosis. Great, thank you. I've got three further questions. Um, colleague Anna Slovic asks, um, do you know the incidence for idiopathic uh, stenosis? How common uh, is it? I can't tell you from the top of my head, but if you, we manage the majority of the UK. So if I say I have half of the UK population with this, and it is 15% of our workload, so that's 150 patients we managed over a 15 years period with idiopathic subglottic stenosis. So there will be like a few hundred all over the country. So the incidence is very, very small. Okay. Uh, the national, the international collaboration recruited just below 1,000 patients worldwide. And this is a very active patient group. They're really well organized. So they capture a lot of people and the numbers are really, really small. That's really helpful. Thank you. We've got a question here about how would you put, um, treat a post uh, radiotherapy glottic web? Uh, that, that's very difficult. Um, mm. as, as you all know, um, airway is of, swallowing is often, often compromised. So we do laser arytenoidectomy. You do a little bit, then they start aspirating. They end up with the pegs and rigs. And then you do too much. And then it's, they end up with real difficulty. Then it's always, you know, it's really difficult. What you should not do is do any open surgery on them. It invariably fails. So I treat them, I try to do as little as I can. So inject some steroid, make cuts with a sickle knife and do balloon dilation. I do some limited laser, trying to minimize the impact on swallowing. You can do a little bit and then come back a little bit later and do a bit more. You can put some steroids which can help sometimes but it is it's not easy and some people end up with a permanent tracheostomy whatever you do we had patients that we managed to get trachees out left them without tracheostomy for many years six seven years later they reverted back and then there was no option but to put a tracheostomy unfortunately okay he, he has um, just webs in general but presumably that's a big topic that we might need to have as a, a separate talk in uh, another time and finally, I've got a question about, can you talk through a little bit more, explain further the cruciate incision for tracheostomy? And, and that will be our final question for the session. So the way I do my trachea, so I cut a window. So when I expose the cartilage, expose the trachea, I know where I pick the trachea ring ideally. And I make my window five by five millimeter almost only. So it's the same width of the trachea ring that will be um, the height. So it is a square at the same weight of the trachea ring, and that will be four to five millimeter, nothing more. So this is the window I cut. So say five by five millimeter, single trachea ring. And then from each corner, I will make a cut outwards 
couple of millimeter cuts on all four corners and that releases the ring and allow it to open without losing much cartilage and then I use the smallest tube possible. So in general, I use smaller tube, the smallest tube I can get away with. So I will do in a normal size, normal height female, I will put a size seven and I, in a normal height male, I will put a size 7.5 and if I can get away with something smaller, I will do smaller as well. Thank you. And I'm just squeezing one final question just before we finish. Um, do you have a preferred dose or regime for steroid injections? Um, put as much as you can in. Uh, so I do, you will you will be able to inject around 0 0.5 to one millimeter max in the area. So that will be um, 40, yeah, between 20 to 40 milligram methylprednisolone. But inject as much as you can get in. You're not going to get more than 500. Um, Michael Mill. Great. Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Agagashi. That's been really helpful, and um, I'm sure a lot of our colleagues have really appreciated your time in that talk.